Central American countries continue to feel the effects of tropical storm Bonnie, authorities report at least one dead in El Salvador as a result of clouds sparked by Bonnie. Italy declared a red alert in major city as a heat wave affects citizens' health. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Ji arrived in Myanmar as part of a tour that will take him to five Southeast Asian countries. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. Stay with us. Central American countries continue to be affected by tropical storm Bonnie, leaving at least one person dead in El Salvador. According to the United States National Hurricane Center, the center of Bonnie was located about 270 kilometers south of San Salvador, with maximum sustained winds of 95 kilometers per hour and a westward speed of 28 kilometers per hour. The death of a 24-year-old woman who was swept away by the current was registered in the Santa Maria dos neighborhood in the department of San Martin. The agency indicates that the storm is growing stronger as it advances parallel to the Central American coast towards southern Mexico and is expected to become a hurricane by Monday. In Australia, authorities ordered the evacuation of thousands of people after floods caused by heavy rains in Sydney. Thousands of Australians were ordered to evacuate their homes roads across the city were blocked and authorities say at least 18 evacuation orders were issued in the west of the country's largest city, an area that had already been hit by severe flooding last March. Australia suffered from ongoing natural disasters caused by climate change, with frequent bushfires, episodes of coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef, and increasingly common and intense flooding. We are now facing dangers on multiple fronts. Flash flooding, riverine flooding, and coastal erosion. So if you live anywhere between Newcastle and Batemans Bay, please don't be caught unaware by the current weather situation. This is a life-threatening emergency situation. In Italy, the Ministry of Health declared a red alert in 20 of the 27 major cities due to the heat wave registered in the Apennines. According to a ministry bulletin, the measure includes Rome and the ministry centres of Naples, Florence, Bologna, Bari, Trieste and Reggio Calabria, where up to 40 degrees Celsius are registered. According to local meteorologists, this heat wave brings with it high humidity, solar radiation and intense weltering. It was caused by three anti-cyclones, Hannibal, Scipio and Huron, which brought in huge masses of warm air from Africa. However, meteorologists predict that this will gradually diminish and cooler air will arrive in the north and center of the country. In China, 27 people are still missing after a ship was ripped in two by a typhoon in the South China Sea. Rescue efforts are still underway following the incident occurred on Saturday. Teams managed to rescue at least three of the crew members of the ship, which sank 300 kilometers off coast. According to survivors' testimonies, other crew members could have been swept away by the waves before the arrival of the first helicopter. The event is the result of Typhoon Shabas crossing through the region, producing winds up to 144 km per hour and 10 meter high waves. Also Sunday, water levels were receding in major rivers in Bangladesh's northeast regions, but the city of Silhet, which was badly hit by the floods, remained partially submerged. The flooding displaced hundreds of thousands, and roads leading to Silhet and Sunamgang were largely cut off after torrential monsoon rains last month. According to official figures, more than 100 people have died since the mid-May floods. Thousands of families continue to live in temporary shelters, and many have lost their cattle and other belongings. The International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Society said more than 7 million people in Bangladesh are in desperate need of shelter and emergency relief. Bangladesh is considered one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. We are living in the water. I keep my cattle at another house. We are in a helpless condition. There is no road to use. We have to walk in waste deep water. 
we have rented a house with extra rent to save ourselves and keep the cattle at another house. That one also has submerged. The Indian government sent the 15th shipment of humanitarian aid for the people of Afghanistan consisting of 2,500 metric tons of wheat. According to the country's Joint Commissioner of Customs, Balbir Mangat, a total of 36,000 metric tons of the grain have so far been moved overland from India to Pakistan through the Atari Waga border bridge in solidarity with the war prone and humanitarian crisis in the Afghan nation. The New Delhi authorities reiterate that they are committed to the goal of completing 50,000 metric tons of supplies for the people of Afghanistan. In Suriname, the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, will participate in the Conference of Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community in Parambaribo. According to his spokesperson's office, his participation in this conference covers the agenda of his second day in the country. He is expected to highlight in his opening speech the need to unite around strong solutions to climate change. During his first day, Guterres met with representatives of indigenous peoples and members of agricultural cooperatives. In addition to attending the opening ceremony of the CARICOM Heads of State Heads of Government Conference, Guterres will meet with the President of Suriname, Chan San Toki, and other senior local authorities. Newly elected Prime Minister of Grenada, Deacon Mitchell, arrived in Suriname for an upcoming CARICOM Heads of Government meeting. Upon arrival, the newly elected Prime Minister was warmly greeted by regional colleagues. In these photos, is greeted by the Prime Ministers of Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Saint Lucia, and Saint Vincent and the Grenadines. We are taking a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. In Bolivia, President Luis Arce called on social organizations to consolidate unity to in the face of the rearticulation of right-wing sectors that promoted the coup d'etat of 2019. The head of state made this exhortation during his speech at the second meeting of the Union Confederation of Native Intercultural Communities of Bolivia, held in the city of Cobija, in the department of Pando. Even this activity, he warned that the right wing that promoted the coup of the then President Evo Morales is trying to rearticulate, therefore, he called for reflection to the social organizations to understand the national reality, emphasizing the importance of maintaining the unity of all sector, social sectors in the face of foreign interests that would try to divide and cause social destabilization in the nation. Three months before Brazil's presidential elections, former President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva held a massive campaign rally this Saturday in Salvador de Bahia, Lula led a walking procession through Largo de la Peña neighborhood to celebrate the independence anniversary of Bahia State. Afterwards, several hundreds of people welcomed him at a meeting in the Fontenova Stadium parking lot where the former president delivered half an hour of speech. During his speech, Lula highlighted the resistance of Brazilian people and called on the audience to commit themselves with the future of the country. Venezuela hosts the 21st National March for LGBT Pride, aimed at vindicating the social struggles of the country's sexual minorities. Hundreds of participants gather in Miranda Park in the morning waiting to start a march to the National Electoral Council to request the compliance of Article 146 of the Civil Code, which provides for the change of name for transsexual and intersexual persons. After the delivery of the document, demonstrators headed to the rental zone where cultural events will be held in a closing concert with more than 200 artists. Demonstrators thank the support of the civil society, the Venezuelan state, and its institutions, besides remembering Commander Chavez, who was the first to raise awareness and recognize the rights of the repressed and ignored sectors of Venezuelan society. China's State Councilor and Minister of Foreign Affairs Wang Yi is in Myanmar to begin a tour that will take him to five Southeast Asian countries. The Chinese Foreign Minister's tour will also include official visits to Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia and Malaysia, as well as participation in important regional meetings during his stay in Myanmar. He is expected to share a meeting of Lan Kan Mekong cooperation mechanisms with his counterparts from Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand and Vietnam. 
Before starting his tour, Mr. Wan expressed that Beijing hopes to further consolidate ties with its Southeast Asian neighbors in search of common development and defense of shared interests in view of today's uncertainties in the world. Uzbekistan declared a state of emergency in the Autonomous Republic of Karakal, Pakistan, due to recent protests that led President Shafkat Mirisi Jajev to reverse constitutional changes. In a communication issued by the authorities, it is stated that the measure will be effective as of midnight this Sunday and will be extended until August 2nd. The document adds that such decrees seeks to guarantee the security of its citizens and restore law and order in the territory. The protest began on Friday after the release of government's proposal to amend the constitution which did not mention the sovereignty in the region causing citizens discomfort. In response and in an attempt to calm the protest, a presidential spokesman guaranteed that the constitutional text referring to the sovereignty in the area would be respected. On Sunday, the Russian Defense Ministry said Kiev carried out deliberate missile and drone attacks on populated areas of two Russian cities. The attacks left five people dead and 21 buildings and 40 private homes damaged. Moscow reported that Ukrainian troops fired at the territories of Kursk and Belgorod regions with Toshkayu missiles and raised drones. According to the Defense Ministry, the air defense system shut down the three missiles launched in Belgorod, but the wreckage of one of them fell on a residential area resulting in the above-mentioned human losses. In that sense, the Kremlin claimed that the attack was deliberately planned and carried out against the civilian population of the Russian cities, since there are no military targets in the region. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu informed the President about the liberation of the self-proclaimed People's Republic of Lugansk territories. According to the Defense Ministry, as a result of successful military operation, the Russian Federation Armed Forces, together with the People's Militia of Lugansk, have established full control over the city of Lysychansk and a number of nearby settlements. According to the report, the territory gained in the last 24 hours represents a total area of 182 square kilometers. Lugansk Oblast is one of the two states that rose up against Kiev in the Donbass region, the liberation of which is one of the objectives of the Russian special military operation in Ukrainian territory. More news coming up after the final show break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. West African leaders met on Sunday in Ghana's capital Accra to review sanctions they have imposed on three military rule countries in their volatile region. Heads of the economic community of West African states were gathering to assess efforts to secure timetables and other guarantees for restoring civilian rule in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso. Mali underwent coups in August 2020 and May 2021, followed by Guinea in September 2021 and Burkina Faso this January. Opening Sunday's summit, Ghanaian President Nana Akufo Addo said the 15 member bloc was committed to supporting the three countries' return to democratic order and would take appropriate decisions after hearing reports on their progress. In Kenya, presidential candidates strengthened their electoral campaigns in the last month before the elections. A historical opponent supported by the outgoing president, will run in the elections in the East African country starting August 9th. The vote is expected to end with a duel between the two big favorites, the historical opponent Raila Odinga, leader of the Orange Democratic Muslim Party, and the current vice president William Ruto. The history of the electoral violence has caused much of the international community to put the spotlight on the general elections in August as they could fuel new social conflicts. The government of Sierra Leone passed a bill that would decriminalize abortion in a country with one of the world's highest maternal mortality rates. At the 10th African Conference on Sexual Health and Rights in Freetown, President 
serious mayorío announced that the two women had unanimously endorsed a first mayoral bill to guarantee the health of all girls and women in the country. President Mala said to be proud that the reform was passed at a time when women's sexual and reproductive health rights were being overturned. and injuring 12 others. The assistant administrator for the district of Chirani in Baluchistan province said about 35 passengers were traveling in the bus. He said rescue workers were searching for survivors in the wreckage of the destroyed vehicles and surroundings. He said apparently the bus slid on the wet road amid heavy rain and fell about 61 meters into the ravine. Deadly road accidents are common in Pakistan due to poor road infrastructure and disregard for traffic laws, as well as poorly maintained vehicles. Last month, 22 people were killed in a similar accident when a bus fell into a ravine in Kila, Saifula district. Unfortunately, a passenger bus was traveling towards Keta when the bus fell into a deep ravine. It could be that the driver slept or the bus slid on the wet road amid heavy rain. So far, 19 passengers have been killed, and 12 injured passengers have been moved to hospital. This Saturday, protests continue in Libya in rejection of deteriorating living conditions and political situation in the country, where two governments have been competing for power since March. Protesters gathered in Tripoli, the capital city, and several other cities in western Libya, blocking roads and setting tires on fire. The protests are taking place in the midst of a serious economic situation, with fuel and bread prices rising, as well as frequent power cuts. On Friday, protesters stormed and set fire to the parliament in Tobruk, in the east of the country. Immersed in a deep crisis over a decade ago, Libya became a failed state after NATO's intervention and Muammar al-Gaddafi's government overthrow in 2011. Telesur English continues to grow. Its signal now reaches Europe. You can order from your cable dealer or tune it yourself. These parameters that you see on screen are in place since July 1st. Quite soon, for a change will be implemented for the signals in the Middle East and Africa. Now more than ever, the world connects to us and our stories are heard in other faraway nations. This news multi-platform will continue providing truthful content to oppose the hegemony media's narrative and our faithfulness to our audience. We have come to the end of this news brief from where you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.